Let me say good morning to our participants. In a few minutes, we are going to start our special lecture. Professor Mandel, Mr. Moravez, distinguished guests, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, Administrators, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special lecture on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimum currency area approach to a global currency. This is part of the event series of Bridges Dialogue towards a culture of peace to be held in Philippines and Thailand from November 2007 to April 2008. In a few minutes, we will start the welcome remark with Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tayurung Road, the Vice President for Research. May I call for Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tayurung Road to give a welcome remark Mr. Morove, UTC Administrator, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I welcome all of you to a special lecture co-organized by the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation. This special lecture is held to commemorate the 45th anniversary of University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and to cooperate with the International Peace Foundation in building up a culture of peace which can only be achieved through broad international cooperation among education institutions themselves by creating alliance and partnerships with a broad range of institu institutions, organizations, educationalists, and researchers, as well as with civil society at large. The International Peace Foundation is well known in Thailand for its variety of peace activities, ranging from lectures, workshops, seminars, artistic events, conferences, and programs. This special lecture on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimum currency area approach to a global currency will eventually provide a forum for interested participants to exchange ideas and cooperation regarding the issues on exchange rate systems and global currency. 
Our special guest speaker, Professor Robert A. Mandel, is a Nobel laureate in economics for his analysis of monetary and fiscal policy under different exchange rate regime and his analysis of optimum currency areas. He is known as the father of the theory of optimum currency and has made great contributions to a number of international agencies and organizations, including the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Commission, and so on. I am confident that all the participants will get great benefit and pleasure from his lecture. The other guest of honor is Mr. Uwe Molowet, the founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, this history lecture may be short, but it surely will be a memorable one for all of us. And I wish you enjoy the talk and have a good time while you are with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assistant Professor Dr. Sawani Tairuburo, for your warm um, welcome. Okay, at uh, this auspicious moment, I would like to ask Mr. Owe Moravez, Chairman of the Board of Directors International Peace Foundation, to deliver his opening address. by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation, under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with uh, local partners, including some of the country's major universities. Starting this November, bridges will be continuously held in Thailand and the Philippines, until April 2008, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The first ASEAN-wide series of bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence, which was initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 250 events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, from November 2003 until April 2005. 26 Nobel laureates, as well as 12 other keynote speakers and artists, such as Dr. Hans Flix, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, and Jesse Norman participated in these events. They were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Maha Chakri Sirinthorn, or Songdet Patel, and reached an audience of 70,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single event, but as an ongoing series in which Nobel laureates, world-known artists, and international decision makers have built strong bridges with Thai leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education, and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation hasn't realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 75 other national and international institutions, including 23 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. 
In this sense, bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, and by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. A globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. Let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live in and which we are able to create anew constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace which needs the participation of everyone. I thank our host today, the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, and its president, Dr. Chira Deb, also what? And our keynote speaker, Professor Ala, uh, Robert Alexander Mundell, the 1999 Nobel Laureate for Economics. He has come to Thailand without any honorarium to support the events, and we now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. A warm welcome, Professor Mandel. for your touched uh, address. Let me start. Well, it's time for the highlight of the event. Today, I have the singular honor and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, who has been professor of economics at Columbia University in New York for the past 23 years. He has been renowned in the profession for his brilliance. He picked up his PhD in six months residency at MIT. From his professionalism in economics, not only has he lectured widely in North and South America, but also in Europe, Africa, Australia, and Asia. He has, he has also been an advisor to a great number of international agencies and organizations. Just to name some, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the Government of Canada, and many, many more. In addition, he has been the authors of numerous works and articles on economic theory of currency areas. He formulated a standard international macroeconomics model, and he was a pioneer of the theory of the monetary and fiscal policy mix. His publications include the International Monetary System, Conflict and Reform, Men and Economics, Monetary Theory Interest. Six volumes of his collected work were also published in Chinese in 2004. And on October 13, 1999, he received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics from the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, and he has become a Nobel Laureate for economics since then. The topic of his special speech today will be on remaking the international exchange rate system, the optimum currency area approach to a global currency. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Robert Alexander Mandel. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, talk to you. I think it's this unique institution, the um, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, University. Uh, this subject uh, that I'm talking on, I'll have some slides like this. Uh, I'm uh, reading the newspaper, something about uh, 
this headline reporting some of my remarks the other day. Fixed currency system outdated. Now, if that were the case, you'd have to throw out all of economics because uh, you could never have, uh, if you didn't have any kind of fixed relationship between units of expenditure, money, uh, you could never have the law of one price. You never have a market. You never have a coherent market. So you, you have to, um, and we have to go into that a little bit. Some of the theory of it, which we'll get into. Uh, uh, we'll, um, I'll look at some of these uh, issues first. Some rough history of the international monetary system um, uh, throughout the last 2,500 years of history. The international monetary system, there has been one. It's been based on some kind of common currency or some kind of standard that, that can be used as a kind of universal currency. Uh, back in the, uh, when, the days when we think that maybe coinage was invented in ancient Lydia, this is one, one theory of when it was invented, about the 8th century BC, then countries began to use coinage. Coinage was overvalued and used it by nation states. And then in the great empires, they all created a common currency because of the great economies of scale associated with the use of one currency or one unit of expenditure instead of, instead of many. Imagine, imagine a world of barter where there's no money. And then you have uh, 10 different commodities or 20 or 100 different commodities. Imagine how complicated it would be to think in terms of, of uh, exchange relationships without a common unit of account. And actually, in the same way, if you had, if you have, how many monies should you have? If we had a system, how many monies would it be good for, let's say, a country of uh, 70 million people? Really, like the whole world 3,000 years ago. How many, how many money should a country of 70 million people, 65 million people like Thailand have? Would it be better to have one money, or 10 monies, or 100 money, or a thousand or a million money? One for each person. What's the, what's the unit? Or how many, how many currencies should Thailand have? Now, if Thailand had many currencies, if you had, you'd have to have um, many issues of the currencies, many central banks. In Thailand, you could have every province could have a separate currency, and then the question would be: If every province had a separate currency, uh, what would be the exchange rate between one currency and the other? Should they always be fl flexible? Would you want to have seventy currencies in Thailand all flexible to one another, or would it be better to have uh, uh, the currencies all fixed so that? Uh, a common unit was, was exist. That's really what the issue is. Another way of looking at it is think for a moment about the European Union. The European Union has 27 members now. Uh, and uh, it's got the European Monetary Union has 13 members now. Recent, the most recent member added to it was uh, was uh, uh, Slovenia, uh, a very, very tiny, tiny country. Now, the 13 members of the European Monetary Union include big economies like Germany. Germany is the fourth largest country in the world now. China took over Germany's place as is, is, uh, is, is number three in this. Uh, Germany, uh, France, and Italy, all countries with uh, GDPs in over over two uh, trillion dollars a year, so they're very large economies, but they're all using the same money. They gave up their currencies. They gave up first. They had fixed exchange rates, and uh, that was better than flexible rates between the European Union countries. And then they moved to to uh, uh, the common currency. They gave up exchange rates. They got the, a common currency is the apotheosis of fixed exchange rates. So we better be careful when we look at headlines like this, fixed currency system outdated. Because if you do, you have to give up everything. There's no, uh, there's no, imagine this world, imagine the world was all the people in this room. And uh, they had, uh, 
and no money. They would start off with, uh, let's say there are 10 products that could be traded. What would happen? People would go around, they'd mingle, they'd make bargains with one. It would be very complicated, but gradually they'd settle on some kind of prices. But there wouldn't be, it would be a very inefficient way of, uh, of establishing a price system. The price systems start usually because there's a market develops. A market develops when, uh, when uh, people look at two price ratios and then they, uh, they always bid. And they bid until they get everything for the cheapest price and they sell things for the most price. Everybody wants to get the most and they want to pay for things with the least. And if there are price differences, arbitrary jurors can always trade back and forth, and then those price differences get uh, get eliminated. So if you had one money in this room with ten commodities, you'd uh, be able to have you'd have ten prices of each of those commodities would eventually be established. That's not too bad. But suppose you had two currencies in the room, three, four, or five currencies in the room units of account, it would quickly get hundreds of prices. In the world today, uh, there are members of the International Monetary Fund, about 185 members, 185 members of the International Monetary Fund. <coughs> now, some of those members don't have a currency. Uh, San Marino doesn't have a currency. San Marino is a little country, a little principality of a 10,000 people in uh, 15,000 people in uh, Italy, they don't have a currency, they use the euro. They don't have a currency. And if, there are a few countries like that. Andorra doesn't have a currency, and some other places like that. Now, uh, uh, Germany doesn't have a currency of its own. Germany shares that with never. So there are maybe altogether represented in the IMF something like 170 currencies, even though there are 185 members. 170 currencies in. But suppose, let's take the, an even number, let's say there are 200, 200 currencies. In a world of 200 currencies, how many exchange rates are there? Well, there's a formula for it. It's a half times n times n minus 1, where n is the number of, uh, of currencies. So a half times n, half times 200 times 199 is 19,900 currencies. You have an exchange rate, 19,900 currencies. You can do that, you can calculate that. If you take look at one of the, um, um, uh, the, the grids on, on the, in the newspapers about exchange rates, and you see cross rates, well, you only have to count half the rate because half of them are, are given up, and then you use one unit of account, and you get, if you have 200, Currency. If you have a grid of 200 this way and 200 this way, uh, you get a half times n times, you get 19,900 currencies, almost 20,000 currencies. Well, supposing we had 10 products to exchange, how many prices would there be? If you had one currency, there'd be 10 products. But if you've got 200 currencies, there'd be 20,000 times 10 products. So you see efficiency element is, you, you, if you don't have, if, if, of course, you may want to have 200 currencies, but if you had them, you could it would be you could economize on the information and transactions cost of it by fixing the price of all the currencies so that they act like one currency. That's what countries did historically. Back starting in Lydia or before, and who knows that India and China may even much before this, they started with uh, a coinage, and that coinage was the coinage was typically based on a, on a metal, on, a, on a, common, a common product that was widely used, and that most widely used product was uh, turned out to be the most efficient, uh, were the precious metals, gold, silver, and copper. You have, uh, you need, uh, uh, they do serve, gold, silver, and copper serve different things. Uh, it's hard to find, if you took the amount of gold that it would take to buy a cup of coffee, it would be so small you wouldn't be able to use it. You wouldn't be able to transact anything with it because it would be a little piece of dust, powder dust of gold, you couldn't use it. So it wouldn't do for 
small transactions. You need even silver wouldn't be very good for it. You need need uh, copper transactions for that. You need middle-sized transactions. Silver for long-term transactions. You need, uh, you need gold. Gold is the one. Gold was the one most used by the richest countries and by for in long-distance international trade because it's the cheapest to travel. Per unit of value, it's the most valuable, and it, so it uh, was uh, the cheapest to use for international trade. Of course, now we don't have to worry about gold and silver because, because we don't um, uh, we don't use those uh, those products. Uh, <coughs> well, that's that's sort of the basic idea. But then, so uh, under the uh, for a long time we had trimetallic trimetallic. Gold, the price of gold and the price of silver and the price of copper were fixed relative to one another. Throughout the 19th century, up until 1873, there was the bimetallic system. The price of gold and silver was fixed. Because as long as one country fixed both gold and silver, and it was a big country, and it was a significant country, then that would be the fixed price that, that would reign in the world economy. In the uh, uh, Napoleon set, uh, France onto the uh, bimetallic standard in 1803. France was a big country then. Now, earlier, 1792, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States, set the United States on the bimetallic standard. It fixed the price of gold and the price of silver, two par values. The gold was uh, 15 times more valuable than silver, so the bimetallic ratio was 15 to 1. And then Napoleon, after France had, after the French Revolution had a big inflation paper, used paper currency, and then Napoleon set uh, France back onto a bi bimetallic standard. He chose the same ratio for gold and silver that uh, had been Louis, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, uh, the Colon ratio it was called, it was 15 and a half to one. So anyway, you had 15 and a half to one in, in France, and then uh, and France was a big country and a big economy. The United States was a little economy then, back then. Of course, over the 19th century, the U.S. got bigger and bigger, and eventually the U.S. economy became bigger than the French economy. And it became bigger than any other economy in, the, in, that, in, that, in that century. But the idea of fixing, some fixing bimetallism was that it let countries all over the world achieve a kind of monetary unity. So it didn't matter. A lot of countries over the world could use the silver standard. And other countries like Britain could use the gold standard. But it wouldn't matter because they have a common denominator of, of uh, the fixed price of gold and silver. The exchange rate is about 15 and a half uh, silver to uh, units of silver to one unit of gold. So we had fixed exchange rates all through the world of all those countries that were either using gold or silver. Now then, in the 1870s, for reasons that are a little complicated, uh, the bimetallic standard broke down. It broke down because, well, in, let's say in 1860, two countries were on bimetallism. Now two pretty big countries, France and the United States. The United States by 1860, it become a big country. Those two countries established in, with a bulwark that kept maintained the bimetallic standard, and that was you had that gave that unit to. Well, then, two years later, the United States. A year later, the Civil War in the United States broke up, and the United States went off specie standard. It didn't have any gold or silver. So France left its bimetallic. And then, in 1870, there was a war between France and Germany. And then France left by metallism. So then no country was on by metallism anymore. That meant that the price of gold and silver would move. And there's a different uh, dissension in the world between the gold block and the silver block. And then uh, gradually, the, um, Germany went under the gold standard. Scandinavia, in Italy uh, uh, went under the gold standard. And then the United States went back to gold about 1879. And then all the world was moving toward the gold standard, and they moved off the silver standard. The developing countries were more on the silver standard. And, but because the 
big countries were going under the gold standard, going off silver, as Germany had been on the silver standard. They dumped silver. The price of silver went down, and the uh, price of gold was going up. Everybody was buying gold. So gold, all the countries that went under the gold, had a little bit of deflation, because gold was becoming more valuable. And the countries that were in silver had a bit of inflation. So there's a big difference between the whole, in the 19th century, the gold countries and the silver countries. The gold countries had a period, whole decade of, of uh, deflation. Or no, not decades. Three decades of deflation from 1873 to 1896. And then the other countries on the silver standard, which include now China and uh, India at this time. India later went on to gold. Uh, were on on the on the, uh, on the silver had had a uh, better better system of, uh, of price. But anyway, the dominant block of the world uh, moved to gold, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, by 1914, all the major countries were on gold. The two exceptions would fairly big exceptions would be uh, 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 China, which was on silver standard. And uh, Mexico, Mexico was a big producer of silver. Now, like, so, so that was the way the world was in 19, 1914. Well, um, but but notice here the hunger, the need, the, the desirability of keeping fixed exchange rates even between the gold and the silver block countries. This is the important thing because because if you have a, a common a common currency in, in the Bimetallism was a little bit like a common currency. This uh, would um, uh, uh, this gave a monetary unity because it meant that wherever you go, you can establish one system of prices throughout the world, and that's the most efficient thing. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, a great philosopher and economist, writing in 1848, said, "So much of barbarism still exists." in the transactions of nations, that uh, nations choose to assert their own individuality to their own inconvenience and that of their nations by having a separate currency of their own. 19, 150 years ago, we thought in terms of a, a global currency. And that, that's, well, th this is, I've left out, this, is, this table enters at the time of the breakup of the bimetallic system. How, how did I choose that 1873 date? I looked at the price of gold in terms of silver in London. And all the time, from 1815 to 1873, the relative price of gold and silver didn't move outside the range of 15 to 1 and 16 to 1. That's about a 6% variation in the price, all through up from 1815 to 1873. But then in 1873, uh, a lot of things were happening. The silver was discovered in Nevada, and, and Germany was dumping, and Scandinavian countries were dumping silver on the world market. And so the price value of gold, and the, the, so the bimetallism ended in 1873. Uh, how, how many of you have heard the, um, uh, have ever seen a movie uh, called The Wizard of Oz? How many have heard of that movie? <clears throat> That's about the gold standard. The Oz is the ounce of gold. The Yellow Brick Road is the gold standard. And the wizard <coughs> at that time was President uh, Cleveland, the model, you see, to satire on, on, the, uh, on the gold standard. And because there's great dissension in the 19th century in the United States because the gold standard was creating deflation. Prices were going down for three decades in the United States, and the Americans didn't like it. Of course, not, not Americans were on a flexible exchange rate in the 1870s. They called it the greenback standard, but they didn't like it. And they, wanted, they went back to the gold standard, but the gold standard was causing deflation. And deflation always hurts debtors. Debtors. And it's, so the, uh, and it's a benefit to creditors. So a fight between creditors and debtors is, in the uh, period, period, period. But then in 1896, 86, it turned around and prices in terms of gold started to rise. 
because 1885 was the great discovery of gold in South Africa. In South Africa, that came on, to the, started coming onto the world market, and even though Russia and, uh, and Austria-Hungary were going on to the gold standard, and Japan was going on to the gold standard, creating more demand for gold, the increasing supply was enough to overcome that and, and gradually move to an inflationary period. Because of, uh, when the tremendous production of gold from South Africa uh, was able to dominate the, uh, the, the uh, system. You know, most of the gold in the t today, in the world as a whole, there's about 5 billion ounces of gold above ground. It's been dug out of one billion ounces of that uh, is in the central bank. The hands of the central bank, maybe. Uh, so another way of thinking of it is, if you want to think of it in tons, about um, a total stock of gold above ground is about maybe 160,000 tons. That's a ton of gold. Okay. But uh, one, one, uh, one billion ounces of gold is the uh, amount that is in central bank stocks today. They still, we're not on a gold standard, but central banks all over the world still have about 900 million or 950 million ounces of gold. Now, of course, price price has just gone up over, uh, yesterday it was, or the day before, Friday it was over $800 an ounce. And this morning, or last night, it was 790, so it's gone, it went down a little bit. But it, it, gold is a very high price of that. So that's the stock of gold. That was used as money. And when countries run the gold standard, currencies were named for different weights of gold. The British currency, the most important currency of the 19th century, was called the pound. The pound, which comes from the Romans. And the symbol it comes from the Roman libra in the pound. But uh, the, because there's a, 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 originally it might have been one pound of silk, a pound sterling was one pound of silk, so weights of gold. But, but uh, the uh, standard exchange rate between the United States and Britain was um, between the dollar and the pound was, uh, the pound was worth 4.86 times the amount of, um, times the dollar. $4.86 because there's 4.86 times as much gold in the pound as there was in, in the dollar. The back of the dollar. Well, these are the systems. Now, just have a, you don't need to do this. I'm not giving a history lesson of this, but it is a good idea because to keep an eye out on these, these trans, this transition because it gives you one way of looking at history. And the history. Uh, of course, you can look at it through politics, you can look at it through all kinds of different things, but this is a good way of doing it. Now, uh, what happened here is that in 1914, uh, World War I broke out. But in a more important event, well, not a more important event, but, but a more important monetary event occurred one year earlier. In 1913, the United States created a central bank. It didn't have one before. Britain had one since 1694. Bank of England was created in 1694, but America didn't have a central bank then. They got one in 1913, Federal Reserve System. Why that became so important is that the United States economy at this time was bigger, not just bigger than the biggest, other big, next biggest economy, but it was bigger than the next three biggest economies put together. It was bigger than the pound sterling, then the pound, uh, and then the, then the British economy, or the Ger plus the German economy, plus the French economy. So you have the, the now, use the term currency areas, that was in the title. A currency area is a zone of fixed exchange rates. You can also think of, of, uh, of a common currency area as, as a currency area. The Thai currency area representing the Thai economy, that's a, that's a currency area. Uh, but, um, but the uh, dollar area, counting the United States, of course, is a currency area, but then 
uh, a lot of countries fix their currencies to the dollar. Panama has done that since 1904. The fixed exchange rate to the dollar. And Panama was created as a country in 1904. And uh, that Panama has had uh, for 103 years now a fixed exchange rate with the dollar. And it gets more or less American monetary policy. It's like a monetary province of the United States. Because it doesn't, uh, it, it has a fixed exchange rate. Uh, it's, it's a little different from a fixed exchange rate. Actually, they don't produce the paper currency. The dollar is a paper currency. And they have a, their own currency called the Balboa, the Spanish, named after the Spanish discoverer, but that's a, a coin. Also, a few countries like uh, Ecuador is dollarized. Ecuador uses the dollar in, in the uh, in currency, the, the national currency. Weapons. And all of the Gulf states, most of the Gulf states in the Arabian Gulf, keep their currency fixed to the U.S. dollar. And China kept its currency fixed to the U.S. dollar from 1994, after devaluation then, to, to two years ago, when it made a little news uh, to let it out, if somebody gets up. So the dollar area is, a, is another currency area. And the European area is another currency area. The European area covers now not just the 13 countries in the EMU, but the, all the other countries that are tied to the EMU uh, with fixed exchange rates, what they call the exchange rate mechanism. Also, uh, 15, 14 of countries in Africa are in the Eurozone. They've been, they kept fixed exchange rates among themselves and to the Eurozone uh, ever since 1945. They, well, 1945, they were in the former French countries, former French colonies of Africa. And then in 1945, the so-called the CFA Frank area, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the CFA, uh, F used to mean Francais, the French, now it means uh, financier, so it doesn't have the French connotation. But they're all, those 14 countries are now tied to the uh, zone. Let's see, this is um, a picture, a picture of it, um, uh, of the world of currency areas. In, in, in today, let me see if I have my, if I got my uh, pointer on the yes. See now, <coughs> now I put down here at the bottom. This is the euro zone. This, this is the euro zone. This is the dollar area. The area represents uh, uh, the uh, GDP, more or less proportion to GDP of the United States. The GDP of the United States is $14 trillion. The GDP of the euro area is $11 trillion, current exchange rate. And the GDP of the yen area is 4.5 or $4.7 trillion. So those are the biggest uh, currency areas in the, uh, in the world. And then the uh, RMB area is the next, because that is, that's now a $3 trillion economy. And, that's the and then the pound sterling, which is independent, it didn't join the eurozone. Is um, uh, is a two and a half trillion dollars. So this is the biggest currency areas in the world. And there now this is what I give the the CFA franc area. Is there 14 countries in the African zone? There are two big central banks in Africa, and they I have about six and seven, seven uh, countries in them each, and uh, they're um, uh, they're tied to the uh, euro. To the euro and absolutely, absolutely fixed rate. But just better start to think with this headline: is fixed exchange rate system out moment. If it were, you'd have to give up the, the euros. The Europeans would have to go back to their um, give up their euro and go back to their national currencies, which is a mess. Well, I mean, all of these countries would have to split off from this and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. be careful what you wish for. You wish for that. Uh, so um, uh, now, uh, if we look at this, this uh, these are features of the gold standard in history. Now, I'm putting those features down. Not necessarily they're not necessarily all good things, but these are things that the gold standard did. Uh, maybe not necessarily always beneficial, but these were things that characteristics of the gold standard. 
But our problem is that when we got rid of the gold standard, uh, we got rid of it without replacing, finding something else to fulfill these things. It was an international gold standard. There's an automatic monetary policy. Just as the, um, all those central banks in Europe, all the central banks in the Euro Eurozone, the, the, the great, uh, the most famous central bank in the world, one of the third, second or third most famous central bank in the world, the Bundesbank, now has no monetary policy. You, you know, the Bank of France, Napoleon might turn over his grave, has no monetary policy, no independence. They're, they're like um, those big central banks have no important what's, what's forever policy. The only importance they have is that the heads of those, the governors of those central banks sit on the council of the European Central Bank. Because a certain European Central Bank makes monetary policy. But if you have, if you have uh, a, any fixed exchange rate system, it won't work unless you've got a budget balance or you have prudent fiscal policies. You have to have, it doesn't mean you can't have a deficit, but if you build up a lot of public debt, you have to pay it back afterwards if you're going to maintain confidence in it. A lot of Britain, Britain had all kinds of wars. Britain uh, had, uh, had uh, seven wars with France in the 18th century. Seven wars with France. Every time it ran big deficits to finance the war, and it won them all, by the way. But it, it, people said that, that uh, uh, the British Empire was built up uh, by, uh, you know, in a fit of absent-mindedness. By, by their, anyway, budget deficits. But then after the war, they'd have a sinking fund to pay back the debt. And they'd get back down again, all set to fight the next war. It's so on joke. So, uh, food and fiscal policy, low public debt, limited international borrowing. Uh, you couldn't have a country having too much international debtness because that would undermine the thing. And the low tax rates, of course, they were all low at that time. And uh, constraint on, uh, on constraint on global expansion, that's something uh, not many people think of, but under the gold standard, the gold standard is a gold depends on the amount of gold. And the expansion of the money supply in the world under a gold standard, a pure gold standard, is limited by discoveries of gold. Well, as the world population expands, uh, demand increases for you need more money, but there's not, enough, there's not an expansion of gold that keeps up with population. Because this gold is limited in the uh, earth surfaces. So the price of gold gets more expensive, which means that prices go down. Deflation. Gold goes up in value, commodity prices go down. That's what we mean by that. So there's a restraint on gold. It's like an environmental warning to us. If you were outrunning the gold supply, too much money going around expanding, population is expanding at a rapid rate, but it, you, the, the gold was a kind of warning, or gold at plus silver, be a kind of warning that there's a limit to growth. And this is a limit. But now we took off, got rid of gold, so abandoned that limit, and only now are people beginning to think that there are limits to growth. We're getting big potential catastrophes to worry about global warming, endangered species, the, the, um, the destruction of rainforests and so on. Too much growth is creating, creating major problems. So the gold standard did this, but, and, but we got rid of that warning sign, and then we've gone along, but now we're, we're getting a warning sign that the world can't expand too rapidly. Population is now six and a half billion people in the world. And uh, just think of what would happen if, if in, 19, in 1800, the population of the world was 1 billion. Now it's 6.5 billion. What would it be at that same rate, if that same rate of population expansion continued into 20, uh, well, um, let's see what, to the year 3,000. Another thousand years. Trillions and trillions of people in the world. Of course, it would be a catastrophe. You couldn't, couldn't have, you can't have that population. Population explosion has, is going to be curbed, and I'm sure, we, I think people think it's going to get up to 
a, a, a limit of uh, nine billion or something, and then maybe it'll uh, go down at, or, or stay stable at some point, nine billion. But, but uh, we don't. Um, uh, nobody. That's really guesswork because all kinds of factors can change. It. Well, um, the the United States then came along became the biggest economy in the world after 1880, and then you can read, read what it said there. And then uh, it uh, became the American century, the dollar became, after World War I, it, it replaced the pound sterling as the major currency in the world, and that's the world that we moved into. Then after Bretton Woods, after, after 1944, uh, the uh, IMF and World Bank were created. That didn't create a new monetary system. <coughs> that just uh, just ratified the monetary system that had come into place in 1944, from 1934, 1934, 1934 to 1971, the international monetary system was based on the dollar <coughs> and gold, with, do with gold priced at $35 an ounce, and that was what characterized the system. That system broke up in 1971 when President Nixon took the dollar off gold and the countries moved to flexible exchange rates. It moved for three months to flexible exchanges, and nobody wanted them. They all hated it. So they went back to fixed exchange rates around the dollar. Before, in the Bretton Woods era, the dollar was convertible into gold, and the other currencies were fixed to the gold convertible dollar. But in, after 19, in this new system created in 1971, uh, the uh, dollar, uh, dollar was no longer convertible into gold, so it was a pure dollar. Well, that broke up, and uh, then for two years, the international, two, 1972 to 74, they uh, got flexible exchange rates, moved to that, but nobody wanted them. Nobody wanted flexible exchange rates. And there was um, a committee, the Committee of 20 was working day in and day out to try to find a way to negotiate a return to a fixed exchange rate system. And it was uh, very uh, difficult to do that. Uh, they, they couldn't couldn't agree on it, largely because the other countries wanted a system, and maybe the United States did too, that would treat the dollar like any other currency. And yet, the size of the dollar was so enormous you couldn't you couldn't have it. You couldn't strap down the dollar. We, we're facing that system today. In the papers over the weekend. People talk about the falling dollar. And some people are saying, oh, we need to have intervention to stop the falling dollar. But how do you get in, in concerted intervention of the big powers? How do you get that? Well, you get that, but, but uh, uh, it's like, like, a, uh, like trying to stop a, a, a waterfall. It's like a, it's a, you, can't, you have to have buying up their excess dollars in the world and people start to dump dollars, uh, the central banks can all go in and buy up those dollars and take those off the market. Thailand can go and buy up those dollars, but in the process it creates bots, creates Thai currency. So you have too much bots, so indirectly in buying up all those dollars would create great inflation, too great inflation in the, in the country. So uh, the other thing to do is, well, let's that currencies are appreciated. And then they, people in countries worry about competitiveness and everything else. It's a mess. The system we have is not, not a good system. It's not working well. It's a, we have to recognize that the, what we, the mistake was in not working harder and getting back to a, 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 an international monetary system again. People thought of, well, uh, at people who were advocating flexible exchange rates were saying, well, there were three three things that they said about flexible exchange rates. They said it would solve all the problems. First of all, if uh, you have flexible exchange rates, um, uh, countries don't need reserves. Well, back then when they were saying that, total reserves were about $50 billion. And today, total reserves are $5 trillion. An enormous expansion. Of reserves, you need vastly more reserves under flexible rates than you need it under fixed rates. And this is the one of the things. The other thing they said is 
you don't have um, you want you don't have exchange control. Milton Friedman uh, basically didn't like uh, ex the exchange control of Britain and the European countries in the post-war period. He said better for them to have flexible exchange rates than exchange control. But now people have exchange controls anyway. Almost every country has some kind of exchange control. Uh, so uh, uh, and then the third thing that that people said was that the advocates of flexible exchange rates, if you have flexible exchange rates, you would have any imbalances. <laughs> we have bigger imbalances in terms of trade deficits and surpluses than we ever had before. Enormous deficit, nine hundred billion dollar deficit of the United States. China's got a two hundred billion dollar surplus. Japan's got a hundred and fifty billion dollar surplus. Germany doesn't have a currency, but it's got $180 billion surplus. And Spain, which doesn't have a currency either, has an $80 billion deficit, $90 billion deficit. So um, you, you, all those arguments for flexible rates were, were, uh, were false. All, you had no prediction about it. Well, we uh, mentioned that the Bretton Woods system broke down. Uh, President Nixon took the dollar off gold. Um, you asked, you could ask the question, gold standard, what killed it? Charles Reese, a very smart economist, said democracy killed the gold standard. And he meant by that that, uh, that the, um, in the, in the, he was the, the president of the Bank of France in, in the 1920s, and he wrote uh, some books on He was a good economist. Um, uh, and he meant that uh, the demands of the population for uh, more governments to do more things for them, for welfare services, all these other things. They're going to put demands on the part of government that they can't afford. They're going to have deficits. They're going to run budget deficits, and then the deficits will have to be financed by the central banks, and then they'll have that will put the countries off the gold standard. Just like war puts countries off the gold standard. That was one thing. Or you could say, some people think that the, the Great Depression killed gold. When Europe went back to the gold standard, because they didn't like in 1925, um, they went back to the gold standard in 1925. First Germany in 24, and Britain in 25, and France in 26. Um, and then the rest of the world went back to the gold standard because they didn't like the dollar standard back in the 1920s. <coughs> they went back to the gold standard, but creating a tremendous increase in demand for gold that brought on the big deflation of the Great Depression, the 30% fall in prices that was the Great Deflation that ended the Great Great Depression. Well then, uh, I've, I've argued that my theory of this is that the United States uh, killed the gold. Basically, the United, not necessarily in any devious plan to do it, but by uh, just by its own policy, eventually the dollar took over and replaced gold. The we're in a dollar standard now, and gold is held in central banks, as I say, 900 million ounces of it, but it's not, not being used for anything now, it's just a, just a commodity created for reserves and uh, something. But the uh, IMF in 1944 was set up to manage the dollar gold standard, a fixed exchange rate system. The I International Monetary System was set up to manage the fixed exchange rate system. When it, it broke down, it lost essentially that function. But then it, it put, we moved to flexible exchange rates, but the, in the treaty, the new treaty said manage flexible exchange rates without any consideration of what that management would be. Now that today in some, uh, big discussions. Uh, for a while, the United States was pressuring countries to change exchange rates on the, on the currency. China, they were pressuring China. They pressured Japan to change exchange rates in the, uh, in the 1980s, which is the Plaza Accord. Um, <coughs> that was, began to be called Japan bashing by the United States. Now it's China bashing the United States. But the United States didn't like the idea of 
doing this bashing, so they shifted it to the IMF. So the IMF will do the bashing. Now, what they, the way that was done is that in 1977, uh, the IMF had to decide what to do if they had any role with exchange rates. And they established this idea, which is called multilateral surveillance. They'd look at all countries in the world, and then they'd give advice on exchange rates in, in that period. Well, this year, uh, th these, these things didn't have much bite, <coughs> and the United States uh, pushed for and got a revision of those guidelines on multilateral surveillance. And this occupied a big discussion in the um, uh, IMF this uh, spring and summer, and they brought out new guidelines for it that uh, would talk about a country that has big trade balance surfaces as they call that currency misaligned. And because people have been criticizing the IMF because they only pick on small countries, they decided to pick on the dollar first. And they came out and said, the dollar is misaligned. The dollar is overvalued. They said that in in October. They said it once in, I think, July, and then they said it again in October, the managing director said that. The dollar is around. Now, the, the real problem, you get into a real problem when you say 